So our first speaker today, Wayne Frankhauser. So Wayne, <clears throat> Wayne is, uh, let's see, I got to get the right place here. All right. So he's the main DOT bridge program manager, and that program is responsible for the design and construction and bridge preservation, rehabilitation, replacement projects statewide, 28 years of experience, right? BS degree in civil engineering from UMaine, former member of the Army. He's been involved in the ASHTO Committee on Bridges and Structures, the T6 Committee. His fingerprints are on bridges all over the state. And Wayne's going to be talking today about the past, present, and future of structural composites and, and really where he sees the DOT headed with us. Wayne? Thank you, Bill. I have the coveted uh, right after lunch uh, window here, so I'll, I'll try to uh, keep this as lively as possible. Um, another thing I've learned, a presentation like this in this group, a lot of the stuff I've, I had planned on, my slides and a lot of stuff I'd planned on covering has already been talked about. So I'm truly going to try to give this a little bit of a twist, the, the practitioner's twist, the owner's twist, and kind of talk more you know, about uh, how we at DOT, specifically the main DOT bridge program, you know, view composites, what we see the advantages are and what we see some of the challenges are in the future. So really got three broad areas. I'm going to quickly, we've all seen the, the, the photos of rotten bridges. I'm going to, whoops, went the wrong way, going to quickly um, talk about, uh, you know, some of the issues we're trying to solve as, as an owner of a bridge. Um, We've we've all seen we've all seen these photos of rotten bridges, and it's really no surprise. Um, you know the conventional uh, bridge materials just don't last. Our, our bridges live in a super harsh condition: deicing chemicals, you know, salt, sands, you name it, uh, freeze thaws, environmental factors. They just really, um, you know, have a tendency to chew up conventional materials. Um, This is a, uh, you know, I always show this photo. I think it's a, a prime example. This is a typical interstate bridge in Maine that was built in the 1960s. So it's not even 75 years old yet. And we're looking at replacing a lot of these bridges and doing pretty extensive repairs on a lot of them. You know, a lot of uh, lessons learned once you've looked at a lot of in-service bridges, you, you quickly begin to identify with some of the areas that are of major concerns. You know, these bridges, they uh, reinforce concrete, they use black steel. Uh, they was painted steel, requires heavy maintenance. Um, all the, uh, many of them are simple spans. So they had joints, which weren't intended to be open joints, but they are now because you just can't keep a joint sealed. So the minute the chloride start, uh, you know, getting into your concrete, hitting that black steel, um, you know, oftentimes it's a, it's a death sentence for these bridges. So. No secrets here either. Uh, you know, our available funding for, for infrastructure just never keeps up with, uh, you know, the, the need we have. We are, you know, kind of always breaking even. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's never uh, quite enough to uh, uh, keep up with the, uh, the needs out there. And I would give a special note right now, you know, we've added a, a new challenge over the, over the past couple of years is we are having seeing really skyrocketing uh, inflationary increases in construction materials, which is uh, really kind of made the issue much worse uh, as far as kind of moving the needle and keeping bridges in, in a, a state of fair condition. And that's, that's ultimately what we're, you know, our goal is to keep the, uh, the, the system safe. Um, so what does Maine DOT do? And I think a lot of states do this. I, I heard a little bit about, you know, a, a focus on the lowest cost. Well, we, when we invest money in our infrastructure, we, we, first of all, we look, uh, and try to preserve and rehabilitate bridges to keep them from going from, you know, good or, or fair condition into that poor category. Um, but it's inevitable that eventually they wear out. Eventually all the uh, deterioration catches up and you have to replace it. Uh, when we do, we look to build them uh, to last. We're, you know, we, we, we're chasing that inevitable 100-year bridge life uh, or longer if possible. 
Uh, and that's where, for us, uh, composites have uh, taken a, a, a major role um, in, in our ability to look at specific areas. I showed you the example of the interstate bridge that had very specific areas of corrosion. And, uh, um, you know, we, we, will, we will look um, at composites and a bunch of other corrosion resistant materials as a specific means to address those issues. So with that, let me uh, run through uh, very quick, I hope, uh, some examples. And a lot of these that you, you, you've seen and you'll hear more throughout the day. So I'm not going to spend any time uh, at all on these. So these are, uh, you know, a few uh, uh, what I see is very successful uses of uh, F FRP in the state of Maine. Um, you. Bill Davis just talked about this. You've seen it in several of the cases. Um, I think we have nine of these in service in the state, the, the, the bridge and a backpack or the composite arches. Um, I believe the first one was uh, Neil Bridge in Pittsfield, which was in the mid 2000s. So this is certainly a uh, time tested uh, uh, structure. It is right now for us when we come to a site and determine that it's appropriate for this, it is, we, we do bid this as uh, frequently as an alternate. So it competes directly with uh, precast concrete. Um, I'm not gonna spend any time with this. I will point out one slightly different view that I think that uh, I have as an owner. Um, and it's, I think it's become more valid recently with some of the craziness in the supply chain and supply of, of, uh, of products. Um, this is, of course, is the G-beam. This is the Hamden Bridge. Um, where it's going now is this, this in the span range, the typical span range, this is a direct competition with a precast concrete next beam. Um, we have no precasters in the state of Maine. We do have fabricators, AITs in the state of Maine. So this is not only is it a, is it a great main product that's being developed by the university. Um, we have in the past uh, had times when we and other New England states have put out enough next beam projects that the supply of next beams, they're, they're not available. The precasters, the few New England precasters are booked. So anytime we can have a viable competition, that ultimately lowers our price, which is, that's where we want to be. That's the goal of, uh, you know, the owner is to get best, best practical price. Um, GFRP, there's been a lot of talk about this. Uh, this is Jonesport Beals Bridge. I think it was an 1100 foot bridge, a lot of GFRP. I stopped changing this slide. Um, I think we are probably well over that one, probably closer to 2 million linear feet of GFRP now. Uh, it is our standard. Um, what we do is uh, GFRP straight bars with bent. Uh, we use stainless or a corrosion resistant bent bar. We have do have some reservations about the ability to uh, uh, adjust bends in the field, and if they're they're short a bar, it's just it it feels more comfortable for us to be able to make those adjustments for the for the contractor to make those adjustments. Um, last time I checked prices, uh, we firmly believe this was very competitive. We were getting uh, very similar prices to an epoxy coated reinforcing steel. So this is a, a, a great example of a product that we are, we are seeing that's really taking off and, and, and really becoming price competitive. Um, Joe Stilwell showed this bridge drain. This, this to me is, is really demonstrates the flexibility of composites and how we can look at it to target very specific issues. Uh, go figure, the steel bridge cranes just don't last. You know, sometimes they were painted, sometimes they're galvanized, no matter what you do, they just don't last. They're, they see the worst of the worst. Uh, when they rot out, um, they will start to spill salt and sand on directly onto the beam, which causes pretty serious issues with steel or concrete, so throw in a uh, composite bridge drain. We've been doing this for quite a while. It's pretty successful. It is, it is standard practice for us. Um, just a few other, uh, I'll, I'll let you read the list. Uh, I wanted to focus on the picture. Um, one thing we have been working on to address the very specific need, and Joe also, Joe Stillwell also hit on this a little bit. 
we've always found that uh, pile bent piers are very cost effective, but when they're done with a fusion bonded epoxy coated steel pipe pile, they just don't last. They inevitably get dinged and nicked during construction. You can't touch it up. That rust concentrates on that spot. We're having to repair those after five or 10 years. So we've been, our holy grail on a pier is to try to find a way to build in composites. This project in Southport, where we spec'd a, uh, uh, there are steel H piles that are driven to refusal. And this composite pipe is a uh, protective casing that goes down into the soft uh, mud layer on this, on this uh, tidal bridge. So it's a, uh, you know, a really place we want to be. So I was going to jump back in slides and kind of recap those, but I'm, I don't dare do that. So I will just point out, if you think back at the slides, we have, the G beams, we have FRP corrosion free bridge beams. We can uh, reinforce the deck with GFRP. We can put in composite bridge drains. We can build a composite uh, pier. So, our future in the near future, you know, our near term future is a completely corrosion free bridge. And we're pretty close. There's, there's a few items that we're struggling with. There's, you know, a few items that we need to see come on to online into the market. Um, but we're we're pretty close to being there. Um, so challenges, and I'm going to kind of take a different track. I'm not even going to try not to look at my slides here. I'm just going to kind of give it from my perspective. Um, you know, this is something that's been talked about quite a bit so far. Um, but Main DOT's had a pretty good um, run of of implementing new technologies and 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 kind of diving in sometimes over our heads, sometimes not, but uh, I'll often think, okay, how did we get there? So I'll, I'll just run down and hit a few of those areas. I think, I think probably first and foremost, a culture of innovation is critical. Maine DOT has developed a culture of innovation. I've been, as, as Bill said, I've been there a little over 28 years now. Some of my first uh, experiences are actually working with University of Maine on some of the early timber and composite bridge initiatives. Um, we certainly have a culture of innovation. It's okay to try new things. Yes, at times you're gonna fail. It's not always gonna be 100% success, but if you keep your eye on that end, and you have that goal of improving the infrastructure, building longer lasting, more durable, lower cost, um, that's, that's, that's what's important. Um, next, I'll say, you know, partnership, I think is, is absolutely critical. Um, we've had a long standing partnership with the university. As I said, I've been in my career, I've been working with them since, since the early, early days. Um, as well as industry, you know, we have a very strong working relationship with industry. So that really gives us the ability to venture into these new areas and have enough confidence, you know, as, as stewards of the state infrastructure, we have to be very cautious. Um, it's, you know, there's, there's uh, people safety is on the line. So when we venture into new areas, we need to have the utmost confidence that it's going to work. And how you get that is partnership with industries, partnership with uh, universities. Um, education and exposure, you know, that's the big piece. I see that coming along more now. Um, I, I will use Joe as an example. Um, Joe has been exposed. He has the experience with composites. Joe Stillwell, former presenter, our fabrication engineer. He's, he's had the experience with composites. So he has the confidence to tackle that where and go area, into areas where specifications not, may not be developed yet and, and develop his own procedures and practices and make sure that everything is, 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 is good to go. That's, that's critical. Um, you know, codes and specs, uh, that's, uh, we have made a lot of progress, Bill uh, pointed out earlier, so several design specifications. I do think we need quite a bit more work in that area. Um, you know, codes and specifications um, really cover the life cycle of a, of a product, of a bridge. You know, the design, making great progress there. 
Um, fabrication, Joe talked a little bit about that. We need to, we need some more code specifications. Um, we need information on fabrication. Construction, I think that's an area we need a little work on. And then particularly in service, when our bridge inspectors inspect bridges every two years, every 24 months in the future, or the NBI requirements, that's an area that I think we need to do a little bit more work. Um, contracting is something we struggle with immensely. Um, we do the restrictions on proprietary and sole source, or excuse me, proprietary and uh, products has been, has, was rescinded by Federal Highway several years ago, but DOTs live in a low bid world. Everything we do is about competition. It's about awarding to the low bid contractor. That can cause some serious troubles when you try to uh, bring in a new technology like a composite. It's, it's uh, you know, very understandable. Somebody is not going to, a business is not going to invest in advancing a composite, a new beam, if there's no promise for return in the future. How does that pair up with our low bid mentality of, of, of departments of transportation? It's a little, it's a little tough. We're struggling with how to best handle that. Our typical approach has um, been to have bid alternates. Um, we do a lot of performance specifications, which allow in areas where there are competition, where there is competition, we'll do a performance-based specification. So there can be different products that, that can be provided. You know, I, I think in the future, there needs to be some sort of look at a uh, best value approach where you can try to factor in some of the other things like longevity, the life cycle cost, you know, some of the benefits. It's not just, okay, this is the cheapest. What's the best? So the best value approach. And I think that's, you know, that's that's somewhere that would be nice to see had. I think that would really open up the door. So um, in this one, the future, this is this just a, a quick, uh, you know, recap of where I see us um, uh, continuing. A lot of this I just talked about. I won't spend any more time on that. Uh, in my last couple of slides um, are, you know, some of the future projects that we're looking at. We do have a couple other of the CT girders of the G-beam bridges uh, in the works, in design now. I believe both of these two bridges that I've listed up there are going to be bid as bid alternates. So we're going to have a detailed um, you know, probably a precast, pre-stressed concrete op option as well as the G-beam option. So it'll be, you know, the, the best value will play in and it'll be a test of, of uh, cost effectiveness. Um, and then another uh, pile bent uh, pier, this, like I said, we've, we struggled with this one long and hard. This is an interesting one. This was a project that was let. Um, the contractor discovered that the conditions in the water, in the riverbed were so harsh that they could not, we, and when we let it, we had a mass pier with a uh, coffer dam and a seal. The soils conditions were so bad that the contractor could not install the, the, the coffer dam. There's too many rocks down there. They just couldn't do it. So we started working with them and say, hey, this was a great learning opportunity to try to advance our options of having a, a composite pile bent pier to be able to work with a contractor and their subcontractor who's HB Fleming who's doing all the pile work to really see what what is out there what what construction means and methods and techniques we can we can use and incorporate composites and build a pier that's going to be, you know, this is the west branch of the Penobscot River, so it's susceptible to ice loads. It's got uh, all the all the checkbox, get extremely rough, uh, difficult soils conditions. So we're we're pretty excited about seeing how this uh, this works out. Right now, um, what the detail is showing are three foot diameter. Um, FRP piles that are socketed uh, into ledge, and then there's H pile and reinforcing on the inside, conventional steel uh, to take the loadings, uh, particularly the ice loadings. So those are the kind of the two areas that um, I'm excited about moving into. Um, and that is it for me. So with that, we'll turn it back over to Bill.